Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Antonio Kedla. I am from the University of Palermo, an ICAR CNR in Palermo, and the title of my talk is Robot Self-Consciousness by Inner Speech and Mental Images Generation. Who am I? Um, I am a um, um, full professor at the University of Palermo. I am the head of the robotics lab, and uh, here you might find my card, and you might also find my email so, and my telephone number in any case. So feel free to contact me in case you are interested in my, in my presentation. Um, this is a joint work with my collaborators, Ariana Pipitone, Francesco Lanza, Valeria Sedita, and obviously the, the Pepper Robot. And my um, robotics lab has been founded in 1996. We are in the center of Sicily, we are in Palermo, which is the center in, the, in, in Sicily. We are in the center of the Mediterranean Sea, and Palermo is the capital of the, of the Sicilian region. Here you might find <coughs> some old and new photos of my laboratories, and we have uh, now, we have the pepper robot, we have the Terranoid, which is uh, in collaboration with the Hiroshi Ishiguro laboratory in Osaka, and we have also had some old robot, a new robot. This is the sponsors of our um, our work, which is the University of Palermo, and the Air Force Office of Scientific Research of the United States of America. My talk concerns essentially the role of internal models in modeling self-consciousness in a robot. According to the internal model hypothesis, an intelligent agent has an internal model of itself, an internal model of the external world, Thanks to the internal model, the agent is able to simulate itself, to simulate its own body action, and to simulate the external environment. And thanks to the internal model, the robot, even the, uh, the, the, the human brain, according to the internal model, the hypothesis is able to generate expectation. And the, the internal model hypothesis, in some sense, is related uh, to the small-scale model of external reality and even to the theory of uh, Popperian creatures uh, uh, proposed by Dynet. According to Eislob, we have an internal model in our brain. So thanks to the internal model, we are able to simulate action, we are able to simulate perception, we are able to generate anticipation, and we are able to simulate even long chains of, uh, of behaviors. So, according to this hypothesis, we have a stimulus, a stimulus from the external environment, the stimulus S1. Uh, thanks to the stimulus, we react to the environment with a reaction one, and then we perform an action in the real, in the real world. So, the real world changes, we have a new stimuli, S2, and according to this new stimuli, we have a new action, R2, and so on and so forth. According to the internal model hypothesis, uh, we have an internal simulation, so we perform an action not necessarily in the external world, but in our internal model, in the internal model. So we have a stimuli S2, which is a stimuli related, so the action R1 uh, generates a new stimuli not from the external environment, but from the internal environment, S2, and so on and so forth. So the outcomes of our action are not necessarily performed in the, the, the our action are not necessarily performed in the external environment, but may be performed in our internal environment, and therefore we may explore our internal environment, for example, to, in order to generate plans. According to the internal model hypothesis for consciousness, consciousness arises by the interaction between the internal model of the agent and the internal model of the external environment. So, an entity, which may be a robot or may be a person, has an internal model of itself, as an internal model of itself, as an internal model of the external environment, the agent performs actions in the external environment and at the same time the internal model of the agent perform action in the internal model of the external environment. So, to 
clarify this point, we have an agent, we have the external world, the agent interacts with the external world, actually the agent has an internal model of itself, has an internal model of the external environment, and therefore the agent interacts with the world and at the same time, in sync, in some sense, the internal model of the agent interacts with the internal model of the external environment. According to the internal model hypothesis, consciousness is related to the interaction between these two models, between the model of internal model, the model of the agent, and the model of the external world. From a computational point of view, we may take into account a general uh, schema, which may be related to with common filter, which is a common, uh, which is a common filter, a common um, computational schema in uh, automatic control and in computer, in computer science, essentially in robotics, where we have a robot, we have a simulator of the robot and the external environment, then when a robot moves, perform action in the external environment, at the same time, the simulator of the robot and the simulator of the external environment evolves, so, when a robot performs an action in the external environment, the simulated model of the robot performs an action in the simulated environment, and there might be some kind of comparison, thanks to a comparator, there is a comparison between the uh, real outcome from the cameras of the robot and the um, uh, simulated outcome from the simulator. The, the, the simulator obviously control, um, is uh, tightly linked with the robot controller. So we may take into account mental images, for example. So mental images in this framework are generated, are images generated by the simulator of the robot and the environment. So in, in some sense, we take into account the hypothesis that the simulator is a 3D simulator, is a simulator of images, so is a, uh, is a simulator related to a sensory, to the sensors of the, of the robot, which may be images, which may be 3D images, and so on. So, mental images in this, uh, in this hypothesis, in the hypothesis of the internal model, are a visual feedback from the internal model of the robot, or of the agent in general. To clarify this point, um, consider, let us consider an example. Uh, there is a robot, a robot with the vision system of the robot. Um, the, the vision system of the robot, thanks to the proprioceptive sensors, um, is, uh, uh, the robot is able to uh, estimate its position, then generate some anticipation of the, of the scene, thanks to the internal model, and um, the cameras of the robot um, um, acquire the, the real, the effective image from the real external environment and then the robot performs a sort of comparison between the expected scene from the internal model and the real scene acquired from the cameras. Let us consider an, an example. The example is related to, uh, there are very old example uh, related to a robot uh, a performance guiding tour at the Archaeological Museum in Agrigento. On the right, on the upper, the upper images on the right is related to the, im to the effective images acquired by the camera. The lower right image instead is the mental image generated by the internal simulator of the robot. In this case, the robot has an internal 3D simulator. It generates mental images of the um, of the movement of the robot, the robot is moving, um, and then the robot generates mental images of the museum, and these mental images of the museum are compared, thanks to the comparison, are compared uh, by the, with the real effective images acquired from the, from the camera. Let us consider it now a um, more, uh, more up-to-date model, related to the now robot, the now robot is a small humanoid. Here on the right you can see the model of the 3D model of the now. In this case the mental image of the now is an allotropic uh, scene in the sense that, that the now look at itself from the outside. So you can see the real now robot 
and the simulated down row. You can see that there are the, the robot splits in two because there is the effective now and the imagined now. So the now imagine itself moving around the camera. Thanks to the sensors, the robot discovers that there, are, there is an obstacle in front of itself and in fact the uh, mental image, the, man, the mental the internal model of the robot is uh, um, updated and there is a new block corresponding to the obstacle discovered by the robot. So the robot imagines some movement, starts its movements in reality. Now it happens something in the sense that the, um, the, um, the sensors of the robot discover a new obstacle, the robot stops imaging a new uh, object, and then it imagines the robot image a new course of action. So there is the ima image of the robot moving around, around the, the new obstacle. So in this case, there are actions performed in the real world of the robot, in the real environment of the robot, and action performs in the image in the per, um, uh, um, environment of the robot. In this case, the mental images are related to the imagined images, to the imagined action performed by the robot in its internal. Okay, in this case we have considered the, the um, simulator, the internal model of the robot, essentially made up by um, 3D information, so information of graphical nature, picture and so on. But we may also have a kind of internal model made up by symbols, so a kind of symbolic internal model of the robot, and uh, in this case the feedback from the, 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 um, uh, the framework is the same, but the feedback from the internal model are symbolic feedback. We take into account the role of inner speech in this sense, so inner speech is a symbolic feedback from a symbolic internal model of the, of the robot, but performing more or less the same action as we've seen before. So it is a kind of feedback, in this case a symbolic feedback to the robot. So, this is a symbolic internal model, from the computational point of view, is a sort of ontology. And uh, uh, we know that, uh, according to the literature, there is a tight relationship between self-awareness and inner speech. Alan Morin uh, proposed this link between self-awareness and inner speech. Uh, we take into account also the theory uh, from Badley of working memory, which is tightly related with inner speech. So, according to Badri, the inner, there is a phonological loop between the inner voice of the robot, so the robot loop, uh, the robot or the person, actually, this is a theory of uh, um, inner speech of persons, of people. So, we have an inner voice, an inner speaking of the person, and the phonological loop allow the inner voice to um, catch the inner ear, so there is a kind of inner earring, and this kind of loop is uh, uh, created, with, is called a phonological loop, and this kind of loop is created between the cover articulation, so the inner voice generated by the robot, and the inner ear that acquires the information from the, uh, from the inner voice. We implemented a, a kind of a, a phonological loop in our robot, so the robot look at an apple, so the, the exoception sensor, so the camera of the robot uh, recognizes that there is an apple, and the, uh, uh, thanks to the phonological store, there is a, a, a symbolic information, so the robot says, thanks to its inner voice, that there is an apple, the apple is green, and so on. This voice, the inner voice, we, we made a cover voice, uh, so, uh, to let us to hear the, the, the inner voice of the robot, there is the phonological, the robot voice is uh, captured by the inner ear of the, by the inner ear of the robot, just like someone in the room uh, shouted the words apple, green, and so on. So, hearing a voice and perceiving 
the, 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 the shape of the here is the, for the robot essentially is, uh, is similar. In this case, thanks to the central executive specification, <coughs> the, uh, the, um, uh, the robot starts of some kind of search in the internal model, and uh, in the internal model of the robot, in the ontology of the, of the robot, there are many information related with the apple, the apple may be green, the apple may be yellow, may be rounded, and so on. Apple is a fruit, even oranges are fruit, and therefore the robot starts some kind, generates some kind of expectation of the fact that uh, as there are uh, um, fruits on the table, uh, like the apple, there may be other kind of fruits, so for example, oranges. So, um, Apple is, uh, is a fruit, orange is, is another fruit, so the robot generates by inner speech an expectation of an orange and then it looks for an orange. So these are some shots, some pictures of, the, of this kind of search. So at the beginning uh, there is uh, the user that uh, asks the robot where is the apple. The, ro the, apple, uh, the robot looks at the apple, the apple in this case is, uh, is this green box. The robot starts this kind of inner speech and then it uh, um, considers the possibility that there is an orange and then the orange is the orange block, uh, is the orange block fixed by, by the robot. There is a case, an interesting case, where um, the mental images and inner speech are tightly related, which is, for example, the case of looking at itself in the mirror. In the case of, uh, of, of the robot looking at itself, there is on the one side the visual feedback from its shape, and on the other side the symbolic feedback from the, uh, from the inner mode, from the, the symbolic inner mode. So we have an extended internal model made up by uh, the, the symbolic shape, the symbolic information on the right, and of the 3D information on the left. So this is the extended internal mode. In this case, there are two kinds of feedback, which are two kinds of interrelated feedbacks, so the visual feedback and the symbolic feedback. You can see this video. So in this case, you can see that the robot look at itself, the robot wears a mask, so the robot uh, sees a, a, a robot in the, in the, in the mirror, he, he sees that there is a robot, he sees that there is a robot with a mask, um, then, starts, then it starts some kind of reasoning, so it's the same kind of robot that the robot look at itself in a mask, he sees that the robot has a kind of mask, so he checks if he's wearing if it is wearing a mask. Then it it, it touch his uh, his face to see if the uh, robot uh, wears a mask. So in this case, the robot is moving is moving his arm, and then it sees that actually the robot is wearing a mask, and so there is an hypothetical probability that the robot in the mirror is the robot itself. Then the robot summarizes all these facts. So there is a robot, the robot is wearing a mask, so there is an hypothetical probability that there is itself, and then the robot look for look in the neighborhood if there is uh, a kind of uh, a similar robot which is close to, to it. There are no other robots close to it, so the robot has, uh, has, is, it is certain that the robot in the mirror is itself. In this case, you can see this, uh, the, on the one side the inner speech generated by the symbolic information and the uh, visual uh, the, and the in and the um, uh, images uh, the inner images generated by the by the robot so thank you for your hopeful conscious attention again this is my card uh, this is my, where there is my uh, address feel free to uh, contact me if you are interested in this uh, in this experiment if you, if you want to discuss with me this uh, this experiment so again thank you for your attention 
Hey everyone, thanks for checking out the session. My name is Stephen Skolny. My talk today is going to highlight similarities between concepts in brain architecture and in computer architecture. In particular, I'm going to be looking at the attention schema theory uh, that has, uh, explains how subjective experience arises in the brain and show how similar processes happen in the everyday Linux operating uh, system. So attention schema theory is proposed by Michael Graziano in a series of papers and books. And uh, it's an evidence-based model of subjective experience in the brain. Um, like the brain, the structure the, uh, and all the things around it are core to the experience and functioning of machines. Um, so while I find AST very compelling, I'm agnostic in terms of different theories of consciousness. I uh, think they all are valid and, and should be considered. Uh, and I do have a larger thesis, which is that consciousness is a current feature of computer architecture and not some kind of distant dream on the AI horizon. This cuts against the grain of how we tend to think about consciousness. The evidence I see is convincing. So while we're gonna focus on an AST context, if you're an AST proponent, you might be convinced of this thesis, um, but most likely you're not. And so I also want to like you to keep in mind um, sort of the larger context of what I'm thinking. Uh, and, um, you know, perhaps in the future, as other theories of consciousness evolve, we can consider this. I've also personally considered this thesis for a lot of the sort of prior models of consciousness, but I believe there's sort of more, more neuroscience left to come to really demonstrate that. Okay, with that background in mind, let's get into uh, AST or attention schema theory. So um, in order to understand it, we need to really distinguish between two things, awareness and attention. And this isn't my distinction. This is something that's come up in the past 20 years of, of research in the neuroscience and psych communities. So while you're reading the slide, uh, you're both aware that you're reading the slide. It's part of your awareness. It's in your consciousness. And you're also attending to it. You have your attention on the slide. So very, very frequently coupled. But we do see these experiments that show primarily unconscious priming experiments show very well how attention and awareness can be separated. So you can show something subliminally to a subject, they don't say they're aware of it, they don't report, and actually in brain scans, you don't see the typical brain um, structures of awareness lighting up while this is happening. So there doesn't seem to be awareness of a certain cue, but there's attention to it. The brain actually tends to it. Um, the subject will respond in a way that shows that the, the cue was factored in. And that's how this distinction has kind of come about. Um, we can also think of attention, I like to think of attention as attention, like the act of attending. And so it's something a lot more mechanical and doesn't necessarily bring in consciousness. It's not just physical attending, but mental attending counts as well as this is typically dealt with, and particularly in these like uh, priming studies I mentioned. And so attention is you know, often thought of as unconsciousness, which is of course as problematic a term as consciousness in certain ways. I think it also factors into this thermostat argument um, you're probably familiar with this argument of oh, a thermostat that attends, it does things, it reacts to the environment, but it's missing this magic ingredient, therefore it's not conscious. So awareness is when we get into the, the consciousness side of what's happening. Uh, Graziano um, thinks of it as a model of attention, which goes along with some of the sort of higher order theories of consciousness, that we need these higher order models of what's happening. Um, although Graziano is very particular about it, which is what I like about his theory. Um, there's self-awareness. We also have a, awareness of others. We know that others have awareness. It's a property that we detect and awareness. Is, and as you'll see, this kind of relationship with others is a big part of this theory. And so it's a, it's a pretty good candidate for consciousness, particularly within the hard problem, you know, experience uh, camp of consciousness thinking. And I'm going to show today that this is going on in uh, every day, uh, every time a Linux installation is, is booted up. So um, let's focus on the attention schema. So an easy, easiest way to think about it for me is the, as, a, as a kind of an extension to the body schema. So it's well established in neuroscience that we have these cartoonish representations of what's going on with our body. And um, that's how we use to actually manage our body and understand what's going on and, and react appropriately. And there are things like the Pinocchio illusion where you can sort of stimulate the arm and make people think that they're, they're you can have distortions in this as well, like their nose is getting really big. Um, so similarly, Graziano uh, argues, and it has shown with a lot of um, studies that there's this attention schema that models our attention. So when we, when we look at some grapes, we have somewhere in our brain, some kind of information that says, I am looking at some grapes. And this is actually, if you think about it, it's necessary. In order for me to say I'm experiencing grapes, I need to have something in my brain which is like, I'm experiencing these grapes. And that's this alpha thing that I mark. If we're not actively looking, but we're rather imagining grapes, 
they tend to schema would reflect that as well. So th here there's no body schema stuff going on, there are no eyes looking at grapes, but we still have somewhere in our brain this representation, a schema, some kind of model that says, I'm thinking about some grapes. And that's the basis of, of self reporting. And one of the things I like about this is, you know, if you look at like the whole Kantian approach to consciousness with the I and the ego, it's just baked in. You can never see I, the role of me and myself is entirely implicit to this whole, this whole lattice, which is a lot of what people sort of discover as they, they introspect and a lot of the philosophy of consciousness uh, focuses on this. Um, I also want to mention in my diagram, I have this sort of, uh, you know, part, <laughs> part of the head here with this representation in. Um, I, I'm not, you know, this is not exactly where in the brain it happens. Um, I'm not a neuroscientist, but Graziano has all, some pretty good um, hypotheses to the exact parts of the brain in which the schema lives and the various different parts of the brain that, that interoperate on it with, with a fair amount of precision. Uh, please refer to his work uh, if you're curious uh, about, about more of that. Um, so in order to demonstrate attention uh, schema theory, in a Linux box, it's not enough for me to um, simply uh, show that the schema is in the box. I also need to show that the information contained within it um, has consequences for the machine. And so it's being used to control the machine, it's being update, updated uh, as the machine is going on, and also we'll, we'll show uh, that um, the claims that machine makes it about. So the self-reporting is tied very intimately with the attention schema. And so these are kind of two additional criteria that I feel like a sort of a bar I need, need to meet in order to demonstrate this. By the way, in this quote, um, Gratzian is actually referring to the, the, the brain, the human brain as a machine, which uh, I certainly like to see people thinking about things in these implementation uh, independent um, ways. And, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a really nice way that this deals with the hard problem, because the hard problem is how does the physical process give, rain, give rise to the subjective experience? And the, AS, the, the attention schema is the core physical mechanism. It's an informational representation that's core to subjective experience it's because it's encoded, because we operate on it, that subjective experience occurs in the brain. So um, I, not only is it great at explaining what happens, I think it, it really um, rubs it up against the hard problem very well, and, and Graziano has some great things to say about it. Again, I highly recommend reading his stuff uh, directly. So I also, um, aside from that sort of you know, technical sticking to the definitions, there's also this like very intuitive sense of what subjective experience is, and the very popular phrase of Nagel's, what it is like to be. And I find that the attention schema also unravels that. So, um, and actually where Graziano's theory came from is this kind of social, social cognition study. So I noticed that Alex is looking at uh, some grapes. Here's me, here's my friend Alex. Alex is looking at grapes, has a sort of beta um, uh, that says, I'm looking at some grapes. That's the attention schema of Alex. I look at Alex and I, I know that I'm attending. I'm aware that I'm attending to Alex, but I also infer that Alex is looking at some grapes. So basically Alex's attention schema is part of my cognition. And the way I break down what it is like to be, I, mean, I find it a very difficult phrase. I don't find many people actually dissecting it. The, the, the word that I find important is this word like in the middle. And that's what I think this phrase is about and why it's compelling. It's about the ability to make comparisons. So I can say, is alpha equal to beta or not? Like are our experiences similar? Are we capable of having similar um, attention schema? Certainly if we're both looking at grapes and we say our, uh, we're actually having very similar experiences, of course, even if we're in the exact identical rooms and exact physical environments with physical positions, it's not just about our bodies, it's also about what's happening in the brain and how we're being aware and we're actually sort of not only attending to the grapes, but if it's part of that larger system that we call consciousness and sort of thinking of Nagel's experience, uh, uh, the example of the bat, we can say, oh, bat can look at grapes. So there's some similarities between the attention schema, but um, there are also a lot of differences between us you know, and bats as well, but maybe there's some range of comparison. And the challenge is people look at this and they're like, how on earth can machines ever, ever be on that scale? And this is what I'm going to be getting at today. Um, so, so with that established, let's um, dig into uh, Linux, the Linux operating system, and my claim that consciousness, in, in the AST sense of consciousness, already happens in, in, not in all Linux, not just like one particular Linux, but all Linux computers, um, unless they're highly, highly modded. Okay, so in order to demonstrate this, I, I need to show three things. Not only the attention scheme exists, but I need to describe how attention is controlled and the, the sort of me the mechanisms of awareness that sort of flesh out that schema to make a full-fledged awareness. And also the reporting of self-awareness happening 
in machines. So um, yeah, and I'm also gonna show not only that it sort of satisfies these definitions, that in very visceral and relatable terms, the hard problem is resolved. So um, the Linux stack, so here you can see the basic structure of the Linux OS. We have the application layer, and most people think of applications kind of doing things on the machine. Like a lot application allocates memory, out, it draws something to the screen, blah, blah, blah. Applications don't actually do much. Applications are highly bound. Like the hardware controllers themselves are gated by the kernel. So everything that the machine actually attends to, the attention of a machine, is all driven by the kernel. It's all at the, at the um, you know, with the permission of the kernel that applications get to do anything whatsoever. And this is done for efficiency and uh, security reasons. So let's focus on, on the kernel. And we can see there, you know, this is, these are the modular pieces of the kernel. And since Linux is an open source project, each of these components is sort of, um, you know, made to, to be able for independent developers to develop them independently and, and you know, they've evolved over time. But the, for example, the memory manager like, has a connection with the applications above, which ask for memory. And it also has a connection with the physical hardware below. So each of these layers kind of connects with the application or a service layer above it, uh, or, or a via a service layer and not the hardware below. Um, so now let's uh, focus on the process scheduler. And the process scheduler is where I see not only the attention schema um, being sort of managed, uh, I guess most directly, and, and all of the sort of things that flesh out the attention schema that, that embody the awareness of the Linux box are happening there. Um, the uh, process scheduler is responsible for controlling access to the CPU, and that's the thing that actually controls what is running on the machine at any point in time. Nothing on the machine can happen without the active buy-in of the process scheduler. And what is the process scheduler? What is the core representation underneath it all? It's a thing called the run queue. And the run queue is a list of processes, and, and these are like jobs or programs, a list of programs um, on the machine. And uh, there's typically one list per CPU, um, often or multi CPU machines are, are pretty standard these days. And these uh, processes can be prioritized and there's often a lot of metadata about them in terms of like how much they've been run, how long they've been sleeping, there, there's sort of additional information about each job in this queue. And what happens with the process scheduler does is it, it makes decisions, it, it will run a certain process, it'll, it'll block another, it'll resume, and it actually interleaves them. At any point in time per CPU, there's one instruction being actively loaded at any point in time. So we can think of, you know, what, what is the machine currently aware of? Aware of? There's sort of a nanosecond slice of the exact, you know, where the playhead is at this instant. And then there's also sort of like, you know, second, if you look over the course of a second, you'll see it's actually many things that it's attending to at a certain point in time. A processes are removed from the run queue when they sleep. And in terms of the, um, the criteria of self-reporting, there are many, many different ways in which this run queue is externalized uh, throughout the machine. One of them is, is this utility called SAR, System Activity Report. It's a pretty standard uh, way of self-reporting. So while there are lots of different algorithms for scheduling itself, this run queue structure is very um, standardized in Linux, not just in Linux, but in a lot of other Unix flavors have used it. Uh, looking a bit more deeply into the process scheduler, we can see how it runs. Programs will ask to say fork another process or, or close another process or prioritize another prop, manage it in some kind of way, and it responds. There's a kind of architecture independent scheduler. Uh, over here, we have all the, the code um, that's bound to the particular uh, CPU. And um, so, you know, uh, based on the scheduling po policy, um, a job will be scheduled or not scheduled. And the scheduling policy, a lot of talk in the consciousness literature about, oh, we, we sort of steer our awareness actively, how kind of magic and awesome it is that our human, humans can kind of decide what we're doing. And we have this, this meta-awareness, metacognition that allows us to shift, shift our attention and know, know about it and know ourselves. And, and all of this sort of constitutes the self in a lot of thinking. And in the Linux box, the scheduling policy is where we start to see flavors of, of how a machine would behave, how it would prioritize its kind of preferences for, for what it does and doesn't do uh, sort of what it attends to or doesn't attend to uh, at any moment in time, which of course affects what its awareness is um, at, a, at any moment in time as, as well. So, um, so here we see um, basically with this model, we can explain in plain code how computers solve the hard problem. So I'll take the hard problem, how physical processes in the brain uh, give rise, and I'll sort of say computation. This is actually maybe the implementation neutral way of looking at it. Of course, you have to then say, um, you know, the brain computes. I don't know how some people may not be into that. Uh, that's how I tend to see things 
Um, so I don't think that's a tricky part though. The tricky part of this is really subjective uh, experience. So how does computation give rise to subjective experience? So I make an analogy here uh, with the attention schema theory that you know, in, in the brain, we have an attention schema. In, the, in this uh, Linux, we have a run queue. And we also have all the parts of the brain that act on the attention schema. And this is what embodies awareness, all the various operations on attention um, sort of create this, this rich awareness. In Linux, the core uh, of that is this thing called the process scheduler. And that's the heart of awareness in a Linux box. Of course, um, you know, there are a lot of things outside of the machine that can affect awareness. Same like my hand, you know, if I hit it with a, a, a hammer, you know, I'm gonna, it's going to shift as well. And just like that, uh, a Linux box outside the process scheduler, there are all different kinds of applications and things happening that can kind of, um, that can shift the awareness of the machine. But it, they have to do it with the permission of the process scheduler. So whatever happens uh, to shift the awareness of the machine has to go through, through that. Um, so I, I think this is a, a good theory because it unravels what it is like to be. So remember my example of a human trying to look at another human, being able to make that uh, analogous comparison. There's something very similar um, happening with machines where they can actually know what the experience of other machines are. So here's an example of a machine uh, running a certain kind of desktop. It's called the Cinnamon desktop. It's a Linux desktop manager. It makes things look a certain way, gives you kind of a GUI layer. And so that um, machine has a, um, in its attention schema, it knows uh, that uh, in its run queue that it's running the Cinnamon desktop. And the machines can actually communicate over the network to say, you know, uh, this machine on the right can tell the machine on the left what it's running, and the machine on the left can say, I notice that uh, the other machine is running Cinnamon Desktop. How does this happen? The very simple technical explanation, and just the top command over SSH, is one way that it could be known. There are actually a huge variety of, of ways in which this could be known. A very common thing that happens on machines. So this is how one machine can look at another and kind of know what its experience is, and look at this question, you know, is my experience like like that machine's experience. Am I running Cinnamon Desktop as well? Um, now, this isn't exactly like the looking at grapes, although we could certainly imagine a, a computer vision system on the camera, on this uh, machine on the left, that would use a camera to look at the screen and identify the kind of desktop and sort of infer the, inter the internal experience of, of the machine on the right. Um, also, with humans, we don't have to, like, sometimes you tell me that uh, you're looking at grapes and I kind of believe you. And, and so uh, this networking example is more like how humans can sort of report to one another uh, what our experiences are, and this can be, be um, you know, trusted or not trusted. Uh, curiously, you know, machines can also lie to one another and also lie to themselves as to what their uh, experience is. Uh, when, when humans lie to ourselves, we call it an illusion, and when machines lie, uh, we call it a bug. So. Um, so yeah, so the, the similarity between AST and Linux is uncanny. It's a bizarre thing um, that Linux was this, all this process scheduler was developed decades before we even had inklings that anything like AST might be going on. And so this uncanny similarity, which I've actually run across a number of times with different aspects of, of um, in neuroscience and consciousness, but it leads me to make this conjecture that I find a, a bit bizarre, but um, I guess that's what conjectures are for. Uh, and that's like for, perhaps necessity has driven information processing in the human brain in very similar ways that it has for uh, digital computers. As we better explain consciousness in the brain, we'll see more and more of these analogous structures in, uh, in the machine. Of course, we need lots of neuroscience to, to go into this, but just to give you sort of one more example, if we look at the global workspace theories, they talk a lot about this shared information structure. And uh, you know that's explained by different parts of the kernel, the memory manager, the file system, and importantly, inter-process communication is how stuff is, is shared uh, amongst uh, the computer and sort of this global layer that all parts of the, you know, especially as we, we talk about the OS data structures, that all parts of the machine kind of use and, and sort of allow the kind of coordination um, that, that makes you know, computers really powerful. So, and we can go into different, different theories and I've actually done a lot of writing on sort of other theories of consciousness to, in the service of, of what my kind of larger, larger theory here. Um, about machine consciousness uh, being a thing in the past. But yeah, so today I've shown from an attention schema theory uh, perspective that the brain and Linux are the same. While they're not equivalent for the structures we're considering, those comprise awareness, having a model of attention, reacting to it, and manipulating attention, being able to self-report it, all of that happens in, in a digital machine as it does in the brain. 
And uh, I bring this up and, and ask you to consider uh, this kind of uh, larger larger thesis that you know, machine consciousness is not dependent on some rich future AI. It's actually present in everyday operating systems. I hope that this has led you to take seriously a theory that's perhaps not so easy to swallow, that machine consciousness has already happened. Um, but yeah, and, I, and, and to try to look for it, not at this sort of high level fancy AI, humanoid seeming like a human stuff, but the, so the low-level behavior of digital machines that are faced with essentially the same kinds of information processing and control challenges that our brain faces have emerged to be uncannily similar uh, uh, in, in both the brain and in computers. Uh, thanks so much for listening, and you know, please reach out to me over email if you'd like to discuss further. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andrew Knight. I'm here to talk to you today about algorithmic consciousness, whether or not it's possible and specifically why mind uploading and conscious computers are impossible in principle. I have a master's degree in nuclear engineering from MIT and a law degree from Georgetown and have just begun a graduate physics program at NYU. So let me start with the fundamental problems. The first problem is an assumption that's made, and I suspect by most members of the audience of this concurrent session on AI and machine consciousness, uh, probably uh, share this assumption, that mind uploading and brain copying are essentially technological questions, that they're possible in principle, it's just a matter of time, uh, but there's no physical reason why they're not possible. So interestingly, if you do a Google search of the phrase, copy the brain, um, you get about a million potential results. A lot of them are copies. Most of them are copies of various uh, other entries. But the point is there's lots. Um, whereas if you instead search for uh, the phrase impossible to copy the brain, um, it yields just one, and that is my blog uh, in which um, I discuss the possibility of brain copying. And so that might give you an idea of how embedded the assumption is in the scientific community that it is inherently possible to copy the brain. Some of the problems that result from the assumed copyability of conscious states and the brain um, is, uh, well, there's lots of them, but one of them is the uh, duplication or teleportation uh, uh, concept or problem. Um, Penrose discusses this. I'll, I'll mention this in uh, a list of references at the end of this presentation. But it's essentially the notion that what happens um, if somebody could, um, you know, on, on the planet Mars, duplicate your brain or your body or whatever it is that instantiates your consciousness, uh, and back on Earth they're supposed to euthanize or destroy the existing copy, um, this um, would seem like it would, it would result in a, an instantaneous teleportation of you, your awareness, to Mars. Um, but what happens if the person back on Earth responsible for destroying the original copy of you uh, was napping on the job and didn't do so? Uh, what, what would it feel like then to have those um, multiple instantiations of your consciousness or your awareness? Uh, another problem is the simulation problem. Uh, Bostrom gives an idea of, um, of, of what would happen if uh, consciousness uh, could be simulated. And, and the idea is that it's very expensive uh, in terms of materials and energy to actually create uh, a single person having conscious awareness. Um, but it's very easy to make copies of software. So if um, it were possible to simulate consciousness, um, then we would expect there to be essentially infinitely many more simulations than actual versions, which would mean that probabilistically uh, you are indeed a simulation. Uh, it's kind of, kind of weird. Uh, another problem is the uh, self-location uh, by uh, mentioned by Adam Elga, it's very similar to the movie Multiplicity, where um, uh, he wakes up from this operation and doesn't realize um, which version of him he is. And then another version, another problem is um, the Boltzmann brain problem, um, which uh, Sean Carroll uh, discusses. And it's just the notion that um, it's far more likely that um, a, a random quantum um, version has um, just uh, accidentally fluctuated into existence 
um, than um, the idea that an actual um, entire world or or solar system or galaxy has instantiated, has, has fluctuated into existence. Um, and so it's very similar to the problem of simulation in the sense that um, any given instance of a, um, of a conscious person is far, far, far more likely to be just a random blip than to be the real thing. So these are just a few of the problems um, that um, would be true if it were possible for conscious states to be copied. And so here's what I essentially want to know. Um, is it possible? Um, and, and I'm going to um, express it in the first person. I want to know, is it possible to upload me to a computer? Um, you know, somebody may say that um, they've succeeded in uploading someone else to a computer, um, but I can't necessarily distinguish um, the real person um, from the simulation on a computer. Um, they may both pass a Turing test, um, but what I want to know is whether or not um, a, a, uh, a scientist could, uh, in fact, upload me to a computer, and what would that feel like? Um, again, uh, is it possible to teleport me to another galaxy um, by the uh, duplication or teleportation? Uh, so I'm going to address these uh, questions in terms of uh, the possibilities due to special relativity, but I'm going to start with a number of assumptions. The first one is supervenience. A conscious state, C1, supervenes on a physical state, S1. And what I mean by that is that instantiation of that physical state, S1, is sufficient, it is adequate to create conscious state C1 of a person having an identity. Now, when I say a physical state, I'm not limiting myself to quantum states, classical states, or anything else. I'm just being very broad and saying there's something physical about the universe, whether it's localized or not, that is sufficient to create that conscious state C1. So, for example, here is uh, here's Einstein, and the question is, what does it take physically to create Einstein's conscious awareness at that moment? Would it be enough to uh, instantiate his head or his brain and those neural connections, etc. Uh, maybe that's not enough. Maybe we need something more, maybe more of his body or things around him. Uh, maybe it's bigger than that. It's kind of irrelevant. The point is, supervenience just assumes that consciousness arises, consciousness having an identity, which I'll discuss later, arises due to some fundamental underlying physical state. And then the second assumption I'll make is that, well, that physical state can be copied. It's, it, it's pretty simple. Either it can be copied or it can't. And what I mean by copyability is that, uh, specifically, it can be copied or repeated in a way that does not prevent other copies or instantiations from evolving. And so um, we'll see later that there may be a relationship to quantum no-cloning. So to say this colloquially in the first person, really what I mean is, really what I'm assuming is that there is some physical state that can be copied that would cause me to experience, to consciously experience that physical state. And then I'm going to now analyze these two assumptions through special relativity. So I'll only have time today to look at space-like separated instances, but this will give you a good flavor. So let's start with some uh, initial conscious state C1 that, of course, is assumed to be produced by some underlying physical state, say, S1. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to uh, essentially destroy this conscious state uh, but copy the information so that I can then make other copies elsewhere. But the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a light cone. And of course, um, uh, inside here is time-like, and then outside is space-like, so that within here there are temporal relationships relative to this event. Outside here there are not temporal relationships relative to this event. So what happens now if I um, now instantiate 
that underlying physical state so that I create that conscious state C1 downstream in space-time. And then I allow it to then just evolve naturally uh, as it interacts with its surroundings. And um, that happens to result in a, an evolution to some conscious state C2. Now, we don't have to talk about streams of consciousness that may not even exist. I'm just suggesting um, that um, um, at, there, there's some conscious state uh, here, and there's a later conscious state here. And there's this just, just some natural physical evolution. Now, um, it seems clear to me, well, not seems clear, it's actually logically follows from those two assumptions um, that um, whatever um, the person was experiencing at this moment now experiences here. That's what it means. That's what supervenience uh, in my definition means. So it's the same person who experiences um, from here, sort of maybe a blip, um, you know, I, I don't know what that would feel like, but um, it's the same person having the same experience here, and that person then experiences some progression to conscious state C2. Now, what happens if, um, of course, by copyability, uh, oh, I'm sorry, th these, this is the light cone of this event, uh, this instantiation here. So what happens um, if we now instantiate a second copy uh, elsewhere in uh, space-time, such that um, uh, this is the light cone of, of this event, and so uh, these two events are space-like to each other. Well, let's say that it naturally evolves to the same conscious state C2. Well, there doesn't seem to be any problem here. Um, the person seems to experience whatever it's like to go from conscious state C1 to C2. It doesn't really matter how it's done because they're exactly the same. But the problem arises now when, um, due to some completely uh, random event, it could be a quantum event, um, that's this instantiation over here of C1 actually evolves to some different state, not C2, but rather some, say, C2 prime. And now the question comes, what does that person actually experience? Well, there's only three possibilities. Either that person doesn't experience anything, uh, in either one of those, both of them, or one or the other. Those are the only three uh, logical possibilities. So consider neither. Now the problem is we've already, um, it, it already follows logically from supervenience and copability that whatever the person was experiencing here, that person experiences here. Or, or let's say, let's say right here. Uh, and so that must mean that the person cannot experience neither because we already know that the pe person experiences uh, at least one of these. So it can't be neither. Now, what about, what does it feel like to experience both uh, paths or streams uh, or evolutions of consciousness? Well, the problem is that um, whatever conscious state uh, is experienced here and here depends on the underlying uh, physical state, which means that um, whatever um, uh, person is experiencing this evolution of consciousness cannot experience whatever evolution is causing this stream of consciousness because they're space-like separated. So if that conscious state depends on that underlying physical state, then um, this person um, cannot experience what's happening here without violating the locality of special relativity. So it can't be both of them. Now what about, okay, so maybe just the answer is just one or the other. Well, the problem there, and you might say, okay, so maybe um, nature just determines, you know, whatever's closest um, to uh, the original event is the one that gets selected. Uh, but the problem is nature can't, um, can't do so because we've already assumed that the required information to produce state C1 is already um, uh, adequately held in underlying physical state S1. So there can't be additional information to distinguish these two. And further, they're space-like separated. So there's no way, even if that were the case, uh, for um, this to somehow send a signal to say, all right, 
this is the person, not this person over here. Uh, so uh, there's nothing to prevent both of those space-like instantiations from um, ultimately being uh, experienced by the person. So it can't be any of these, uh, and therefore we have a contradiction when it comes to space-like separated instances. Now it turns out you can do uh, a nearly identical analysis for time-like separated instances. I don't have time because uh, I'm limited uh, it, during this, uh, but nevertheless it is described clearly in my paper that I'll reference at the end of this presentation. But at the end of the day there's a very similar analysis for time-like separated instances. So what you end up getting is a contradiction by special relativity so that we can conclude that copyability is false. Now, supervenience itself may or may not be true, or may or may not be false, because copyability implies supervenience. So if this is false, then that doesn't really tell us anything about this. But that's okay, because all I cared about was whether or not it was possible to copy a physical state to produce me elsewhere? And the answer is, it's not, because copyability is false. Therefore, a conscious state cannot be copied or repeated unless something about the universe prevents those copies from evolving different, differently. Or said more simply, there is no physical state that can be copied that would cause me to experience that physical state. Now why? why? What might be a physical explanation? Well again, I'm limited on time here, so I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, one possibility um, is that, or one hypothesis, is that it is simply impossible to adequately measure some underlying physical state, S1, that produces a conscious state, C1. And it could be because uh, the information is already zooming away at the speed of light, or because uh, measuring it would collapse a wave function if, in fact, uh, you know, quantum mechanics uh, is um, nonlinear. It might be because the information can't be measured with adequate precision, there's quantum uncertainty, etc. Another hypothesis is, well, okay, maybe in principle it'd be possible to adequately measure the physical state, but it doesn't matter because you can't create it anyway, and uh, this may be because of quantum entanglements or correlations with particles that are zooming away at the speed of light. Uh, maybe uh, state S1 is just simply too big. It could be because the state S1 is history dependent. That's something that I'm currently working on in one of my papers. I'm not sure what the correct answer is, but it is interesting to note, I will just mention as an aside, that the only known physical mechanism that prevents the existence of multiple copies of the same entity is quantum no cloning. So this may suggest independently some relationship between consciousness and quantum mechanics. I don't want to go down that route, but it is interesting that uh, this does seem to um, relate to uh, quantum no cloning. And so one thing I can conclude then from the fact that copyability is false is that consciousness is not algorithmic. Why is that? Well, an algorithm is nothing more than software. It's nothing more than a deterministic set of instructions that converts input to output. It's easily copied by its nature. It can be reset on the same computer, or it can be, uh, lots of different copies can be executed on lots of different general purpose computers at different places in space time. So you make lots of instantiations of them, that's not a problem. Well, but if a conscious state cannot be copied or repeated, but an algorithm can, well, then that seems to imply that an algorithm cannot itself produce a conscious state. Therefore, consciousness cannot be algorithmic. And then from that, of course, flows that mind uploading, brain copying, and conscious computers are all fundamentally, in principle, impossible. Now, given the audience here, people who uh, very likely already believe that machines can be conscious, it's just a technological limitation, uh, you'll likely have lots of objections. And I address these objections in my paper and also on my blog. 
But there's one that stands out, one that always comes at me, and one that uh, you almost certainly are thinking of right now. And it's probably got nothing to do with quantum mechanics or relativity. It probably has to do with the nature of identity. So the way this objection typically goes is something like this. Well, how do you know that two instances of the same physical state, S1, or even the same conscious state, C1, how do you know that they're the same person having the same identity? And so uh, this, to use the philosopher's lexicon, this is stating that two physical copies are not numerically identical. Okay. Here's the thing. If that's true, if it's true that two instances of the same physical or conscious state aren't the same person having the same identity, then that means there's nothing to copy. There's no physical state to copy that would produce the same conscious state of the same person. And we've gotten to the conclusion of non-copyability. But if it's false, of course, then I've just shown that special relativity makes it impossible to copy a physical state that produces the conscious state of a person. So either way, copyability is false. Now, the same objection could be said a different way. It could be said like this. Well, my definition of supervenience is false. Supervenience generally just means that in, in this context just means that a conscious state depends on an underlying physical state. But I've added something here, you probably noticed, um, that um, the instantiation of physical state S1 is sufficient to create a conscious state of a person having an identity. So um, you might just say, oh, well, that's, that's, just, that's just false. There's, there, there, there is no identity, or, or it's not the same identity, or something like that. Well, it's absolutely irrelevant for the exact same reason that I, I just uh, mentioned in the earlier objection, which is the same objection. It's irrelevant because if um, supervenience, my definition of supervenience is false, then also my definition of copyability is false because that copyability uh, depended on the initial supervenience. In other words, if my definition of supervenience is false, well, once again, there's nothing to copy that's going to copy that same person having that same identity. And that's the thing that I'm, I'm concerned about for, for me. And every conscious person, if you're conscious, you should be concerned about for you. Um, not so much whether you can create, whether um, other people are conscious or other conscious states can be copied, but whether you could be uploaded to a computer or you could be duplicated, just as I'm concerned about whether I could be du duplicated. But if there's nothing physical to copy that would copy me and my identity, well, then it's not possible and there's nothing to worry about at that point. So in other words, if supervenience is false, so is copyability. But if supervenience is true, then I've just shown through special relativity that copyability is still false. So either way, copyability is false and ultimately it means that uh, there's nothing that can be copied that would produce me elsewhere in a conscious state. So thank you for listening. There is a much deeper analysis, especially regarding the, the most typical objections regarding identity, uh, in this paper that you can find on the archive and which is now under consideration by a journal. I'm very interested in your questions and your comments and your feedback, and I can be reached at uh, this email address. And then finally, here are a few resources that I referenced in the talk. So thank you again for your time. What can theoretical computer science contribute to the discussion of consciousness? And here are the three authors, Manuel Blum, who's had a long-term interest in the brain, Avram Blum, who's an expert in machine learning, and myself, Pernod Blum, and I'm interested in non-standard models of computation. We also want to understand consciousness. We want to give a simple mathematical model to help us get this understanding. 
we want to give a good definition of chung. As you may recall, in 1950, George Miller defined the magic number, 7 plus or minus 2, to indicate the amount of information that one could keep in one short-term memory at any moment of time. So a chunk could be a word, a, a digit, a poem, maybe it's the first phrase of a poem, and then that leads to the next phrase and so forth. And what we'd like to do is to give a formal definition of this informal notion of chunk. We want to distinguish between simulating and experiencing. We want properties of consciousness to be emergent, not programmed in. We are not looking for a model of the brain, nor of learning or cognition. We are looking for a model of consciousness. We are looking for simplicity, not complexity. Our view of consciousness is that consciousness is a property of all properly organized computing systems, whether made of flesh and blood or metal and silicon. Our thesis is that the architecture of these systems is what makes them conscious. Our architecture explains the brain at a very high level of abstraction at a level well above that of neurons. We give a formal definition of a machine for consciousness. We find consciousness in the model and point out properties of consciousness in the model. We are inspired by Turing's simple yet powerful model of a computer that helps give understanding of computation. And here is a 23-state universal Turing machine that can compute any computable function. What that means is if you can compute a function on the cloud or in a supercomputer, you can compute it on this uh, small Turing machine. You can get your head around a, a Turing machine, but not the cloud. You can prove theorems about what and can and cannot be computed. Thus inspired by Turing, we aim for simplicity, not complexity. Our architecture formalizes the theater model, the global workspace model of cognitive neuroscientist Bernard Bars. And Bars describes conscious awareness through a theater analogy. Consciousness, Bars says, is the activity of actors in a play performing on a stage of working or short-term memory. The inner speech actor is often on stage. Their performance is under observation by a huge audience of unconscious processors in long-term memory that are sitting in the dark. You've probably had this uh, happen to you occasionally time to time. You're at a party, you see somebody you know, but for the life of you, you can't remember her name. Then about a half hour later when you're home, her name comes up to the stage, your consciousness from the audience of unconscious long-term memory processors which have been thinking, searching. The conscious self on stage doesn't know how or where her name was found. Here's a famous example that most mathematicians know. Henri Poincaré describes what happened to him. He'd been working day and night, day and night, on a problem that he couldn't quite crack. Um, and luckily, he says, a friend asked him to go on a trip. And this is what he says happened. As I was about to board a bus, the idea came to me without anything in my former thoughts seeming to have paved the way for it, that the transformations I had used to define the future functions were identical to those of non-Euclidean geometry. So what's going on here? Here are two areas of mathematics that Poincaré knew very, very well. He had never seen the connection before. But then all of a sudden, uh, it pops up into his head that they're isomorphic theories. The unconscious processors were working hard and long and then finally came up to this conclusion, which popped into his head. Here's Barr's model of consciousness. At the center, he has working storage, that's his stage. And down below, he has many long-term memory processors, that's the audience. On the left, we have input coming to the working storage from the outside world. And on the right, we have output going to the outside world from working storage. Uh, Barr's also has a central executive. You can think of that as a stage manager or stage director. Now to our conscious Turing machine. We start with a tiny short-term memory. It's a read-write memory. Uh, that's our stage. And on stage, the actor can hold one chunk. We actually can get away with one chunk. It gives us all the power we need. Then we have the audience of long-term memory processors. They're parallel. They're powerful. 
In the beginning, some may be connected, and after a while, more and more will become connected. We can think of these uh, processes as our sleeping experts, and indeed, each processor has one of Alvin Blum's sleeping, sleeping experts algorithm, which based on feedback does its learning, and it's a major component of the dynamic. We have no central executive, and indeed, the central executive functions emerge from the long-term memory processes through the dynamics. So we have an external input, it's read only. We have external output, write only. And they're not connected at all directly to short-term memory. We'll shortly see how they are connected. We have a down tree, which facilitates the broadcasting of a chunk in short-term memory to all the long-term memory processors. We have an up tree, which facilitates the competition. All the long-term memory processors compete with each other to get their chunks on the stage. And here's um, an example of one of the competitions. So what's going up here is a chunk. And what a chunk is for us, it's a tuple. It's an address of the processor that's produced the chunk. It's a gist, which is a small amount of information. It's a weight that the processor has given to the value. It presumes of the gist, and there's a mood. And to start with, um, the mood uh, starts as the same as the weight. And in these uh, chunks going up, I've only given you two parts of the tuple, the gist and the mood. So let's see how the competition works. Here we have the pain processor that's produced a chunk with some pain gist, and the joy processor that's produced a chunk with a joy gist. And what's happening is their mood is minus five of pain and plus three of joy. And the competition function says whichever has the highest absolute value mood is the one that wins. So pain wins the competition here, the local competition. But its mood is actually reduced. It's the sum of minus five and plus three, and it's minus two. So the joy had a sum effect over here. Now, pain is going to compete with fear, and as you can see, fear has the highest absolute value of the mood, so fear is going to progress up here, but its mood then is minus 2 plus minus 5, which is minus 7, so it's actually even more negative, and so forth. And then fear, this is going to compete with something over here, whatever the comp wins the competition, we'll get into short-term memory. Um, in our general model, we, at the juncture, we actually make our decision based on a weighted uh, coin toss. And this probability, a probabilistic model, is actually quite a bit more powerful than the deterministic model. And that's what we work with in general. So what happens when a chunk gets up into short-term memory? It is immediately broadcast by the down tree to all the long-term memory processors. So it's a fast broadcast. And now let me show you the whole dynamics. Um, when an input comes in from the external world, it goes directly to the long-term memory processors. Uh, here we have something going from the eye and the ear and coming in. As soon as uh, input comes in, all the long-term memory processors, if they've seen this or not, uh, they're producing chunks. And they're competing again to get into short-term memory. And let's say that the process of the fear processors chunk one and got into short-term memory. Immediately, that's broadcast down to all long-term memory processors. And in particular, maybe the speech processor decides to act on it. And it then screams. Notice here that processor B, the speech processor, responded to the fear processor. And long-term memory processor A will link up to processor B when B answers A's call. And you might think of this as the heavy end rule, the neurons that fire together, wire together, and linking enables conscious processing seem to come, become unconscious. So over time, there's more and more uh, linking coming on and more and more unconscious processing. Uh, linking, in effect, modifies the uptree topology. You notice we had a binary uptree, which is perfectly fine for the power that we need. The chunk in short-term memory is what we call the conscious content of the conscious Turing machine. And consciousness in the CTM is the awareness, or in other words, the reception by all long-term memory processors 
of the conscious content of CTM. And the constant activity of chunks competing to get up to SDN and then broadcast to the long-term memory process, competing to get up to SDN and then broadcast to the long-term memory process, this creates a stream of consciousness. I've just shown you a picture of our conscious Turing machine, but actually we, we define it formally as a seven tuple, SDM, LTM, downtree, uptree, links, input, output. And the reasonableness of our definition of consciousness lies in the number of concepts that the model explains easily and naturally. Let me give you one example. Here's blind sight. Blind sight is a condition when people's uh, vision processors are working fine, but they say they're blind, they can't see. And here we see a gentleman sitting in this sort of obstacle course of a living room, and he's asked to go to the other room over here. Perhaps there's food there, and um, he gets says, but I cannot see. However, he gets up, walks to the door, avoiding all the obstacles. What's going on? So here's an explanation, a high-level explanation using the CTM. So what's happening, input is coming from the external world, maybe from, from the vision, to the vision process, or maybe also from hearing, which is giving a message to the walk actuator, and the gentleman then uh, walks perfectly well to the other room. But the connection to the short-term memory from vision is either broken or non-existent. So without access to short-term memory, he has no conscious sense that he can see. Manuel will now continue to part two. He'll talk about what gives rise to the feeling of consciousness, the easy and hard problem for pain, and long-term memory processes that are needed and those that are not needed for consciousness. Thanks, Lenore. Consciousness in the CTM is defined as awareness of the contents of short-term memory by long-term memory. In the CTM, all hard work is done by the processors, all of which operate unconsciously in LTM. Assuming CTM is a good model for human consciousness, we are conscious of only the gist that is sent from STM to LTM, no more, no less. And what is that gist of which you are conscious? It is always one of five things, an inner voice articulating your thoughts, and be one of them, an inner image, perhaps when you imagine a dream, uh, a map, or a dream image, and sensation, and inner feeling, and so on. Although consciousness in the CTM is defined to be awareness of the content of short-term memory, that definition leaves open the question, what gives rise to the feeling of consciousness? Our answer, all LTM processors know what's in STM. So if any processor is responsible for consciousness, that processor knows what's going on in STM. Some LTM processors are particularly responsible for consciousness. These include an inner speech processor that translates all speech in STM brainish, the language of the brain, into an inner speech akin to what the ear hears from the external world. An inner vision processor that translates all images in STM brainish into sketches akin to what the mind's eye sees in dreams. And this third is especially important. Both inner and outer sensations are broadcast from STM. All that the conscious Turing machine is conscious of in the real world and in dreams are gists from STM. This means that the gist that produce the outer images of the world are the same as those that produce the inner images, for example, dreams. Now for our big question. Will the CTM have the feeling that it is conscious? Yes or no? We believe that yes, but how do we prove that a CTM feels conscious? We don't. The reasonableness of our definition of consciousness lies entirely in the explanation it gives for consciousness, the extent to which those explanations agree with our intuitive feelings about our own consciousness, the range of concepts that the CTM explains easily and naturally, and the CTM's response to situations unforeseen by CTM's creator. Here are some concepts explained by the CTM. Why is short-term memory so tiny? 
First, it ensures that all LTM processors pay attention to the same conscious thought. Otherwise, if STM contained the gist from many processors, it would be unlikely for them all to focus on the same thought. How is a math proof understood? When you have fully understood a math proof, you feel that you have its entirety in your hand. What you actually have is a gist, the idea of the proof with pointers to its definitions and lemmas. How do LDM, LTM processors decide what signs to give their weights? In an infant, hunger and pain are negative, food and love are positive, the infant's signs are built in. Later in life, if sign is not obvious, sign is taken to be that of the current mood. How are the feelings of pain and pleasure to be explained? We are not talking about the knowledge of pain and pleasure, we are talking about the feelings of pain and pleasure. Just because pain is negative and pleasure is positive does not imply CTM will feel pain and pleasure. So what does make CTM feel pain and pleasure? This brings us to the easy and hard problems. The easy problem is to make a robot that simulates feelings like those of pain and joy. The hard problem is to make a robot that truly experiences those feelings. But first, let's distinguish between simulation and experience. In the disorder called pain asymbolia, the patient knows she has pain but does not suffer. Adults who get pain asymbolia from a concussion know what pain is, claim they still have pain, but say it's okay. These people can have a root canal without anesthesia. They know they're in pain, but it's okay. They claim that their pain is still present, but that it doesn't bother them anymore. The robots we build are pain as symbolic. We know how to make robots appear to be in pain, but we don't know how to make robots feel the pain. We have four suggestions for explaining the experience of extreme pain, only four. First, broadcast. Extreme pain is an actor that takes over the entire stage. It prevents all other actors from reaching the stage. Pain messages and only pain messages are broadcast. Every processor knows of the pain. In extreme cases, nothing else can enter STM. Now, there's confirmation for this. Under conditions that normally cause agony, pain asymbolics can think while normals cannot. From Educational Psychology Review, the impact of persistent pain on working memory and learning by Smith and Ayers. Participants that identified as experiencing low levels of pain for six or more months performed significantly worse than pain-free participants on a variety of tests. However, while broadcasts account for some pain, they do not account for the sudden excruciating pain at the moment you tear a ligament. What does? Interrupts. Sudden extreme pain, a finger touching a burning stove, interrupts all unconscious processors. Interrupts, as opposed to broadcasts, cause processors to instantly put their work on a stack, forces them to pay their maximum immediate attention to the cause of the interrupt. This differs from broadcasts, which send their information to processors without forcing them to put what they're doing on a stack. And then there's screams of pain, in brainish which is a much richer language than simple vocal English. Uh, brainish, the, you not only hear, but you see and you feel. Uh, interestingly, a powerful vocal scream can interfere with the screams of pain in brainish generated by an LTM processor. Vicious cycles, but I won't go into that. Questions? Which LTM processors are not needed for consciousness? Which are needed for consciousness? The answers will help us understand consciousness better. It's very interesting that most LTM processors are not needed for consciousness. And you can go through them. For example, vision and hearing processors. Helen Keller lost both vision and hearing, but was nevertheless conscious. Some people have prosopagnosia, face blindness. They are conscious. SM had its calcified amygdala and as a consequence felt no fear, none, zip, but she was conscious. Phineas Gage lost his prefrontal cortex when a pipe went through his skull, 
it changed his personality, but he was conscious and so on. Here's, in fact, a picture of Phineas Gage uh, with the picture of his skull there. Which LTM processors are needed for consciousness? We believe just three are needed. The first is a model of the world processor for distinguishing yourself from what is not yourself. The second is an inner dialogue processor for planning, forecasting, and so on. It might be in English, but for a dog, it could be dogish. Some broad, general, minimal ability to think, including motivation, which we consider to be energy and drive. What happens to your consciousness if you lose processors for model of the world and inner dialogue? Jill Bolte Taylor is a neuroscientist who lost both when she had a stroke. She says that when you lose that model of the world, you can't distinguish yourself from the rest of the world, and the world is beautiful. She lost her inner dialogue processor. It was very difficult for her to plan to do things, but she needed to get some help. And fortunately, she understood that. She had the broad general ability to think and the motivation, the energy and drive to do it. So she was able eventually to write this wonderful book. You know George Gallup's mirror test for self-awareness? It captures the three requirements for consciousness. Here's an elephant that sees a mark on its forehead in the mirror. It has a model of the world for distinguishing self from not self. When it sees the mark in the mirror, it tries to remove that mark, not from the elephant in the mirror, but from its own forehead. It has this inner dialogue for planning because to remove that mark, it has to get that trunk up there to remove it, something it has not done before. It has the ability to think including the motivation and energy to do it. So yes, an elephant can pass the mirror test for self-awareness. Other animals too, a chimpanzee can pass that test. How about fish? There's a fish that you can buy for your saltwater aquarium called the cleaner wrasse fish, small, beautiful fish. When it sees a mark on its chin, it will go off, try to rub it off and then goes back to the mirror to check if it succeeded. There's a genus of ant called Myrmica, three species. All three have eyes, all three pass the test. You paint red paint on their plate on their forehead, and when it sees it, it tries to remove it and then checks in the mirror again to see if it succeeded. So yes, uh, there's some wonderful animals that do pass it. and. Uh, that's the end. Thank you. And we'd be happy to have your feedback. Thank you. Hello, I'm Daniel Montoya from Fayetteville State University in North Carolina. I want to thank the scientific committee for the opportunity of presenting in the Science of Consciousness 2020. I want to use this talk to pose some questions about selfhood and consciousness and artificial intelligence, especially related to the issue of normality. In short, can an artificial intelligence become normal or behave normally? I have more questions than answers and what I'm proposing here is to create some sort of map to ask the right question. So when we're talking about consciousness, we're talking about the self. And the sense of self has been established for uh, some time already. It comes from the representation of the body. And others believe that this self develops as, as a result of linguistic interaction with other people. And also through the mirror social interactions. We establish our self by the interacting with other beings that has the same kind of body that we have. As we can see here, there are two elements that are needed to establish a self, a set of boundaries that will be useful to develop more advanced forms of consciousness. On one side, we need proprioceptive information from the body, something that tells us where our limbs are located, where are they in relationship to objects, 
and aware and this proprioceptive information is used to establish goals and move in the environment at the same time we need the presence of other beings that are similar to ourselves in which we can mirror our consciousness the interaction with other beings that are similar to us help us to establish our own boundaries and to mirror their behavior which becomes very useful to develop cognitive elements and ultimately a consciousness these developmental characteristics are considered essential for the normal development of a self-conscious individual and the real issue is that they are not available to an artificial intelligence when we propose an artificial intelligence called attain self-consciousness without being established inside a body subjected to a developmental stage it creates some questions about its capacity to be considered normal so the question that I'm asking for which I don't have a specific answer just a set of approximations is can a disembodied artificial intelligence after attaining consciousness be considered normal? the issue becomes a little bit more clear if we think about the development of a brain inside a jar we can technically now create brain connections inside a test tube or a petri dish and make them grow but that brain will be hallucinating it will be unable to create a normal form of consciousness this is very similar to what is happening to our development of artificial intelligence right now so I would like to start by defining or trying at least to define what is considered normal in terms of human and the definition of normal or normality includes thought processes consciousness and behavior and it is mostly defined by the absence of illness there is no specific <laughs> definition of normality but there are tons of definition of mental illness for example there is a history of classification and approaches to mental illnesses for example Michel Foucault in his big book about history of madness his review doesn't seem to include the definition of normality but it's very detailed about all the forms of abnormality and how humans have classified abnormality or mental illness during ages the question becomes really relevant when we start talking about the concept of normality what is considered normal we humans do have a limited capacity for self-monitoring for example this study in 2003 show that only 13% of an interviewed population could be considered free of mental impairment on a total of 3200 applicants only 400 of them were free of mental impairment at the same time in 2018 later on in 2018 Castellini and colleagues they did a study of sexual behavior in young population of Italians and they found out that paraphilic thoughts and abnormal behaviors are not really a deviation from normalcy but they are really quite widespread around the population around this young population leading us to the question is what is considered normal what is abnormal in terms of sexual behavior um, on the other side we had to consider the issue that cognitive and behavioral insults during development increase the chances of mental illnesses and this mental illness appears and we understand that is correlated with the wire in our brain for example this study of uh, Buso in 2017 showed that abuse in early abuse or sexual or uh, any other forms of abuse are associated with reduced cortical thickness in medial and lateral prefrontal and temporal lobe region so in order to define what is normal and what can be considered abnormal there is a tool that has been in use in clinical circles for a long time which is the diagnostic manual uh, DSM-5 is their current version and it's used to establish what is a mental disorder and what can be excluded the issue is that insurance companies and the government requires classification from the DSM-5 to reimburse clinicians in this manual we see that a mental or physical disorder must be associated with either present distress 
a painful symptom or disability, impairment on one or more important areas of functioning. There has to be also an increased risk of suffering death, pain, disability or loss of function. The normality function constant should encompass, from this point of view, a biobehavioral, social and also environmental level. Um, we also understand there are some studies, for example, by Beer and Nove in 2017, asking people what do they consider normal, how do they arrive to the concept of normality. And they found out that people's representation of what is normal is influenced both by what they believe to be a descriptively average event or behavior and what they believe to be a prescriptive idea. So in one side people use a description of what is average to consider normal and on the other side they use an idea, an abstract idea or as a prescribing element to name what is normal and what is not. So these are the two main elements that we usually define from a professional, from a professional side and from a let's say more civilian side, how do we see uh, something and we let in mind that it's normal or not. We have several definitions of abnormal. In this case, we're using Wakefield's definition. He defines something abnormal as a harmful dysfunction, using on one side a social norms term, and on the other side a scientific term that refers to a mechanism that is broken, that it fails to perform a natural function for which it was designed by evolution. So the case that he is proposing is that inhibitory processes by which irrelevant associations are normally excluded from consciousness, he said they are defective in schizophrenic patients. For example, a patient notes three marble tables in a cafe and then he immediately concludes that the end of the world is closed. We can see here that the normal mechanism of association is broken. So what is normal for an artificial intelligence? What are the parameters of normality that can be applied to an artificial intelligence agent? We know that artificial intelligence are not programmed, they learn. By default, their function is defined by the programmer. In that sense, they are a reflection of the human mind. A couple of examples. We will end up with a paranoid artificial intelligence built for a military application. On the other side, we have the example of Microsoft Tie in 2016 when it was published and in less than 24 hours it started repeating racist and misogynistic speeches thought by the user. So in that sense, artificial intelligence even when it's not programmed, they learn from human. They learn from the interaction with human. In that sense, they are a reflection of the human mind. So when we're talking about parameters of normality, what exactly are we talking about? As we pointed before, the existence of a body and similar beings to mirror our behavior is essential for normal development. In absence of a body for an artificial intelligence, we are left with a default company policy, for example. And we have seen what happened with, for example, facial analysis software, facial recognition software, where the software usually has a 0.8% error rate for light-skinned men, but the error rate jumps to 34.7% trying to recognize dark-skinned women. This is not a bias in the algorithm itself, but on the stimuli used to train it. It's the bias ingrained in the, in the person choosing the original stimuli to train the artificial intelligence. On the other side, we can have a, a self-sufficient machine. We can think about it as something that can happen. And this self-sufficient machine could determine its own parameters of normality. And these parameters may or may not align with what humans consider normal. Today, an artificial intelligence is simply a collection of layers in a neural network. We download different instances of the artificial intelligence and we interact with it through an app. This is what Watson artificial intelligence looks like housed in the IBM building up 
there in upstate New York. So how does a machine interact with the world? As of today, as you have seen in the picture, a neural network housed in a server does not have direct interaction with the world unless provided some visual and auditory input. It doesn't have access to touch or sensory motor information. In short, it doesn't have access to a body. So besides a body, an artificial intelligence needs awareness and understanding as prerequisite for consciousness. Here's a depiction of that idea where awareness and understanding are central pathways that will lead eventually to consciousness. In awareness, I'm also including self-awareness, well, including the issue of the body, as we mentioned before. But I'm trying to position myself on the other side of this issue. Let's assume that an artificial intelligence has acquired consciousness. The question that we need to ask on the other side is, is it normal? Is it a normal consciousness? What are the parameters that we need to establish in order to answer that question? We need a general framework to establish parameters in order to evaluate an artificial intelligence. And it can be done in the following categories. The artificial intelligence shows awareness and understanding. The artificial intelligence shows self-consciousness. And the artificial intelligence exhibits normal behavior, hence is safe to interact with humans. Is it possible to establish if a machine is conscious? We can say that a machine acquiring awareness and understanding will have access to consciousness. We certainly hope so. But how can we ensure parameters of normality in the depths of a proprietary algorithm? Does an algorithm have access to intentionality beyond the intentions of the programmer? What parameters do we use to define them as normal? Let's assume that we can establish clear parameters that determine a particular artificial intelligence has rich consciousness and self-awareness. Is this enough to consider it safe for interaction with humans? And here is where the issue of normality becomes central. It may need to be defined differently from the conception used in humans. In order to determine if an artificial intelligence is normal, we need to establish a normality test, probably. And there are two levels on this and two kinds of approaches that we can actually put in place in order to answer the question is a machine, an algorithm, a neural network normal? There is the bottom-up approach defined by normal physical working conditions, the processing, connectivity, and stability of the inputs and outputs in the machine, algorithm, or neural network. And we can say that if an artificial intelligence in general is doing what it was designed to do, it could be, in principle, be considered normal. But this is not the only important issue. The most important issue, especially with intera when interacting with humans, is the other side, the top-down approach. We need to rate the quality of interactions with humans, agents, and the goals of these interactions. Specifically, following the DSM-4-5, we need to check for the presence of present distress in the users and checked for increased risk of suffering death, pain, disability, or loss of function. Not in the artificial intelligence, but in the human user. Together with these approaches that we mentioned before, we also need a set of ancillary solutions, a set of elements that need to be developed in parallel with software development. We need to develop an artificial intelligence able to use previous experience to affect current conditions. This is one of the central elements that we as humans use on a daily basis when we learn from our mistakes and we use that learning in future events or interactions. We need also to develop a fail-safe button for humans when 
any of the parameters mentioned before go haywire in artificial intelligence, at least there will be a human mind controlling the final output or controlling the function of the artificial intelligence. We also need to start thinking of artificial intelligence beings or agents as isolated elements. We need to give the AI the chance to experience itself in relationship with other similar beings. All of these elements are necessary, together with what we mentioned before, to develop some parameters, some framework in which we are sure that artificial intelligence has developed normally. So my proposal as a glance is something like this. We will get to the point where uh, artificial intelligence is able to achieve awareness and understanding, self-consciousness, and it will be able to show some kind of behavior. And, and we propose, we expect that it will be some kind of normal behavior that could lead to consciousness. But that's not our central issue here. Our central question is, is that consciousness achieved by artificial intelligence normal? And so in order to test that possibility that the artificial intelligence have an abnormal behavior due to the elements that we mentioned before, like lack of a body, lack of interaction with other beings, we propose a bottom-up approach where we check the technical capabilities, the technical issues. Are all the connections and inputs outputs correctly? develop uh, is the physical hardware um, functioning properly etc but that's not the only element that we need to consider and in order to consider the relationship between the artificial intelligence and the humans that will be using it we need to also consider a top-down approach where we check for distress in the human user and also we need to check for risk specifically we need to make sure that there is no present distress in the user, that the interaction with uh, artificial intelligence is not creating distress, as we have seen with the artificial um, face recognition software. And also we need to check in, during that interaction for an increased risk of suffering death, pain, disability, or loss of function in the human user. This, in general, is my proposal. Uh, in the beginning, trying to ask the question, can an artificial intelligence develop a normal consciousness? The risk is really high that an artificial intelligence created inside a machine will not develop normally, will not be able to develop understanding as we understand it, will not be able to develop the same kind of self-consciousness that we have, or in the end, will not be able to develop normal behavior if there are no other ancillary elements like development of a body or interaction with similar beings. Well, this concludes my presentation with uh, more questions than answers, and that was the original idea. Um, at the end, it may be impossible to establish that a machine consciousness is normal. Maybe because the kind of consciousness that they achieve is completely different from what we expect or what we are able to understand as consciousness. It may be well the case that the machine and artificial intelligence develop some form of consciousness but we are unable to interact with it. So thank you very much for listening and I will be ready to answer any of your questions. Thanks. Welcome everybody to my presentation, um, asking whether AI uh, tends to lead to illusionism um, and whether this tends to be a risk um, to altruism. Um, and some of the interpretations also then will ask whether that might even explain the Fermi paradox more speculatively. Um, I am uh, an economist, PhD. I've written my PhD in St. Gallen uh, and um, in Oxford. And 
I am interested in digital economics, um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, science of the mind, altruism, animal welfare, topics like that. Um, this is a short version because we only have 20 minutes. Um, I'll paint a little bit black and white here, I would say, sometimes. Um, of course, there are many subtleties, but there is not exactly the time here um, to enter into all of those. I just try to be as broad as possible in some sense of possible implications. The definition of illusionism that we are working with is really that of um, the idea that the phenomenal experience that we're talking about is like an illusion created by our brain. We convince ourselves that we have feelings and are kind of important that go beyond mere computation, um, but nevertheless, that it is essentially computation, basic physics, and that there is no intrinsically valuable feeling uh, on top of this. Um, background on illusionism, illusionist positions uh, in the direction of what I've just mentioned, um, has been uh, have been proposed by uh, different figures in consciousness studies. Dennett, Frankish, Kammerer are surely among them. Um, nevertheless, uh, it sees a theory um, or a view that seems to defy what we most obviously think or feel to know, of course. And uh, Chalmers in 1995 has coined the term, seems to not take consciousness seriously, even though he has also noted that the theory itself is to be taken seriously, if you want. What I'm going to talk about, um, first, uh, asking uh, or looking at the emergence of AI and um, how this emphasizes the closeness of brain and machine, and then asking uh, to which degree the exposure to AI may popularize illusionism, whether this is rightly or wrongly the case. Um, and then uh, finding that, yes, I have the impression that this does lead to that, um, likely. Uh, illusionism, uh, whether it can severely curb altruism. Um, so do we, do we need this kind of idea that there is this phenomenological um, feelings uh, in order to sustain altruism? Um, and then again, rightly or wrongly, may altruism be curbed? That is, uh, there could be a case where, well, there should be no altruism if illusionism is true. Or of course, it could simply be, well, in practice, maybe people become less altruistic if they are become illusionists. Um, both are kind of a little bit independent. Um, and then implications, social risks, after all, altruism is very needed in our society, and the need for policy. Uh, talk uh, about Trump and speculate a little bit more about Fermi paradox and that the artificial intelligence may kill itself before it even exists, uh, or may also kill us before we even exist indirectly, um, and an altruism paradox. First two premises. Um, the first one being the computationalism. The whole idea of the work is based on the notion of the computationalism or one notion of it, um, meaning essentially computationalism, well, uh, whatever I'm doing with my brain and, and therefore to you and everything is kind of ba basically explainable by physical uh, look at neurons directly linking my senses to my tongue, my legs, and my moves. Um, but there is still going on something going on beyond that that we can't explain physically. The weak part of computationalism. So there is something beyond physical computation. After all, I feel something that doesn't just feel like a mathematical equation. There is the hard problem. Um, in some, we presume actually computationalism that is probably very popular by now. Um, it can kind of probably be seen as the modern view about any extreme assumptions. Then we also uh, presume something like that we call aware, aware AI, um, meaning essentially roughly AI that we are getting more and more familiar with, with our mobile phones and things like that, but maybe um, in a way that is slightly more advanced where people really experience that this AI can do stuff that we traditionally thought only um, a brain that goes beyond simple computation or something like that can really be doing. But again, I do not presume here any particular revolution. I don't necessarily presume that super intelligence is being observed by us. Um, or an AI that can do everything that we can. Um, the first hypothesis that AI leads to illusionism 
um, in two different parts. First, asking whether in reality AI, the emergence of AI or the possibility of AI suggests that issue, illusionism is true. And then whether um, maybe more or less independently of that, um, AI simply makes illusionism more popular as we get more and more exposed to AI. So um, importantly, the aim is not here to convince you necessarily of illusionism. Um, I think illusionism, um, there are really um, various reasons that would suggest, well, it really is, is, a, is a weird um, idea, but there are also um, reasons that actually can make it maybe a bit counterintuitively less um, surprising. The key claim here is that essentially experiencing more broadly of our AI, something, somehow we move maybe from almost nobody today or yesterday believing in illusionism to kind of either a minority, a majority, or almost everybody potentially subscribing to some more illusionist views about ourselves. Um, so first, the first part of hypothesis one, is, is illusion really true? And does AI necessarily suggest that? Um, I think we can say in the past there were two compelling reasons um, that suggested that in our brain there is something magic going on rather than simply computationalism. Um, only humans, first of all, have had non-trivial smartness. It was the only thing we observed that had this innovative understanding and everything that, that, that even now machines can't necessarily do in, in all the details yet. Um, so it likely, there was something beyond the physics that we understand because everything that we understand cannot do even innovative understanding and thinking um, itself. Um, so why not there to also directly be something that is really beyond the physics in terms of feelings, right? The second reason, of course, the more traditional one, we feel that we feel. This is kind of even more trivial than the cognitive ergo sum potentially you could say. Um, how could it all be an illusion? Now, the first reason clearly simply has gone uh, against the mechanism. And AI has already done so much. We already have so many concepts of how we can do stuff, also innovative thinking and painting and dreaming and all that stuff in some way. Maybe a little bit primitive way still, but it's all getting there with AI nowadays. The second reason we feel that we feel, and you can't tell me otherwise, that is, of course, tougher to track. But the next slide. Uh, does not go into detail here, but gives you just at least a short list um, of potential reasons why you nevertheless could think of illusionism being more true than you may naturally be inclined to. First of all, very simple. Well, the heart problem itself is equally weird, um, could be said to be equally weird as illusionism itself. There is this heart problem, we can't deny it, and we don't have good solutions, even though if we have conferences like this one where we try to find good solutions. Um, the second one is essentially saying, well, for illusionism, it's something we really deeply feel it can't be true because I deeply feel that I feel rather than just being a computational equation or something. Now, we had this at least twice um, already in the world uh, with us, with our brain. First of all, traditionally, we have grown up as being God-believing um, for, for, for thousands of years, and in one way or another, um, spirituality and things, uh, sorry, believing that everything is maybe animated and stuff. Um, and people would have, I, I think, uh, unquestionably, many people at least, not everybody of course, would have unquestionably supported that, well, they feel there is a God or something like that. It goes beyond merely having heard or read in a book. They feel it. They would have given their life for it because they're so short. Same with free will, that you have free will in kind of free free will, uh, libertarian free will idea that you really decide independent of what physics that you've inherited and stuff like that. Um, this is really something you feel traditionally and only gradually we have, for example, um, overcome the idea or many have overcome the idea that um, or at least deviated from the idea that God exists and, and influences them directly. Um, or that we have a genuine free will and we have become more compatibilist. So many people have. So this doesn't even mean maybe there is a God, maybe there is a free will. We can debate that, but people have by now often 
many people have overcome the idea that what we traditionally felt um, must therefore be true. And it might be as well similar with illusionism, right? Um, third, this whole idea of recomputationalism being there, that is widely accepted, but actually the, the, the stronger computationalism um, of illusionism not being true simply cannot easily be made consistent. Why? Um, with recomputationism, there would be everything that we do is physicalist, but maybe not what we feel, right? There could be something beyond it after that we have said in the premise. The thing is, there, that could be true theoretically, there is nothing that directly necessarily needs to speak against that. But the problem is that we act according to all these feelings, right? I claim that I have these feelings and I speak it out. I just don't just esoterically feel it somewhere in a cloud or something like that where my, my feelings are. It feeds back to what I'm doing. That's why after all, we're here at this consciousness conference. Why I'm talking while you're listening. Uh, potentially, you're one of the most people probably who are interested in it because of the heart problem. So we have this weak computationalism um, that just isn't really satisfactory when we then look at what we're doing. So to make the computation more compatible with what we observe, we almost have to go to stronger and illusionist versions of it. Fourth, we can make a zombie. Uh, likely, we can imagine to make a zombie that believes that he's um, having real feelings. I can write the program where the zombie answers, oh yes, I do have feelings. And then can make a more elaborate zombie that really is an investigative thinker about himself also maybe but eventually when he goes down and tries to introspectively look where are these reasons coming from why he wants to do what oh it's programmed into him then he needs to do it and it can maybe be elaborately programmed into him so that it feels seems to him um logically or yeah seems to him like feelings and maybe that's just what we have them um in event of whether that means computation, uh, illusionism has to be true, illusionism may become popular also anyways, right? Um, what are the chances of that? I'm not going to give a number, but I can just note that um, beliefs are often based on feelings if they're about complex topics. Beliefs um, may track uh, more really the facts and the logics when they're about simple things that we can easily understand. Um, combining both may easily lead to, the, uh, to this, that when we observe more and more AI that gets more and more complicated, even though it's based on mathematics and computation and physics only, um, because we program it like that after all, um, if they then start to behave like us being more complex and things and having similar kind of um, um, behavior in the world and complexities, then it seems easy for humans to kind of see them as par, more or less par in terms of how they're thinking in that sense. And nevertheless, we know that the bots are only maths and physical electron faults because that's how we create them. That's how we program them after all, right? Taking one, calculating one and one together, the bots are computation, but the humans are very close to the bots. That kind of brings us naturally close to the view of the illusionist. So in sum, on hypothesis one, I see various elements pointing towards illusionism becoming more popular as AI emerges. And the question then is what happens when we become more and more illusionist as a society? First, um, does illusionism really justify um, the reduction of altruism? The utilitarian almost by definition might actually say yes. Um, the deontologist who simply asks maybe kind of on some more general rules what is what makes sense uh, what can i do so that eventually the society works the way it does now or that i want it to work well then maybe i would not be able to be and uh, reducing my altruism because after all for society to work i need to everybody has to do their contributions maybe so maybe me virtue ethics is more interesting maybe because on first side you could say well i still want to treat those my fellow humans in a good way because that kind of seems virtuous after all it makes my character being good and things like that but if you really think about it most virtue ethicists might not necessarily say that you cannot shoot a bot in your computer game if you just know that this is after all just a game maybe that's fine right um some may have their skepticism but uh, it doesn't virtue ethics don't necessarily always protest against computer games 
and if the other humans would be just merely bots that are that roughly the same thing as kind of um, the, the characters in your computer game, well, then of course, even Vertex would necessarily say that you should not be bad to other people. More practically, is illusionism um, reducing altruism, independent of whether it should or not? Um, well, I think embryos, animals, computers, these are maybe good comparisons of, for looking of how we tend to deal with beings that we do or do not think they have um, um, uh, phenomenological experience. And here I can't go into detail again because of time, but animals, abortion questions, and um, how we need to treat AIs all the time. The law, as well as also the arguments of most people, tend to hinge um, about uh, on the fact whether we think that those other beings um, or elements in, in our world tend to have phenomenological experience or not. If they don't, people tend to assume, and not all, but they tend to assume that you can do something with them. It is nearly unheard that somebody says, oh, is it really bad to lose a life in Super Mario because my Super Mario might be hurting in the computer game? It just barely exists, anybody saying that. But now, um, it tends to be the case from what I've heard that illusionism talks all oh, tend about, oh, maybe there are reasons why we still need to be kind to each other. Um, I just find this, there are reasons why we can save altruism. We are not only altruist because of pure um, oh, um, other regarding preferences of, oh, I really want to be kind to that person because that person suffers. There is warm glow, there is just general preference for being kind maybe and stuff. But it just is not so clear, I think, that altruism can be saved. That's the main conclusion. Good. Few implications. I'm going to be very fast because time is running out. Altruism versus cooperation. Of course, cooperation itself is not the same thing as altruism. Cooperation is I cooperate with you because I know that you will give me something back. And this can, of course, potentially be maintained. It will be more clearly cold hard if we really think that the other one is just a computer next to me. And um, with also its dangers, of course. We need to have policies if what I'm proposing here is true because um, altruism is not just a nice thing to have. It is typically seen as really essential for scholars in the domain, for example, Kier Kessner or Amartya Sen. Um, and non-illusionists may have to be, of course, the core people fighting for um, policies supporting um, uh, collaboration in a society where people would more and more be illusionists and seeing the others as just like means to an end almost, right, in the worst case. And importantly, the non-illusionists should probably fight for policies keeping people's egoism in check, not necessarily fight against the spread of illusionism because that may be futile or the loss of feminine altruism. Quickly on Trump, um, you may see Trump, uh, as many do, as a selfish person, putting the US and other people uh, at, 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 at big danger just for own gains. And um, well, think about what if he was an illusionist. That's just to illustrate a little bit what we're talking about, right? If he was an illusionist, you could barely be angry on him. Um, because for him, well, he just sees, would in that case see himself in a, like a, as a human zoo or something, not the human zoo actually, but in a computer game. Everything else around him is a computer, is a calculations. Why not try to be exploitative and play around a bit in weird ways that may uh, take the odd Super Mario in there out, right? Doesn't matter so much. Such people may probably exist, I would guess. Um, uh, illusionism doesn't seem as far-fetched as it, when you look into detail, as it may feel on first sight, superficially. And I would not be surprised if such kind of people, if that kind of views, would even become more common. Quickly on the Fermi paradox, a bit more speculative. Um, Fermi paradox, the lack of evidence for extraterrestrial civilizations is by high estimates for their probability. And there could be two ways how we could um, see uh, illusionism from AI um, and the, the fall away of altruism. Um, to be related to this retrospective version, think about this. Becoming smart as a species in the, in the evolution makes us lethal at ease, how I call it. I could easily kill you in the night um, as soon as I can develop some weapons by hands. It's a bit more difficult, actually. Um, and me being lethal at ease means if I'm not a little bit altruist, you have a sleepless night if you're in my tribe. 
if I'm a bit altruist and I don't like to kill people, of course, that's uh, maybe much easier to collaborate and to work and live together. Um, but now illusionism may be a key ingredient to reach altruism. At least if you look at it now, right, we see um, uh, I post, uh, I suggest that maybe without illusionism, we are less, much less altruist to each other, potentially. So it could be that this illusionism has been a key ingredient for our evolution into an intelligent species that can still collaborate. And um, what if this illusion then happens rather because after all, if illusion was, would be true, then it would be actually far-fetched. Um, uh, to even think that the others really matter in that special way. Another way, and that is maybe less less happy because it could be the forward-looking one that would essentially suggest, well, what if what we just discussed about is so true that society really has no way to go evolve further and become more intelligent just because our collaboration breaks down if altruism recedes because people being exposed to AI become more aware that, oh, after all, maybe those others around me are just worth as much as like an intelligent computer right, in the worst case. Um, uh, with weirdly in that sense, we could even think that artificial superintelligence is killing us or maybe simply itself because of killing our, our, our uh, technological progress. Maybe we'll survive but not necessarily thrive so much anymore. Um, it could be in that sense theoretically imaginable that superintelligence is being avoided by ourselves um, simply figuring out that actually we don't want to contribute so much anymore to the, our peers and that means socially in the aggregate um, in some sense removing kind of like a super public good or something like that um, or super externality that we have in each other, against each other. Good, very briefly an altruism paradox in a similar vein a little bit it could be that um, a society that has evolved into a more egoist, uh, like, like genuinely maybe from genetically or something in terms of predispositions, more egoistically, um, could actually survive more in the longer term when it takes that path towards um, artificial intelligence, recognizing that, ego, uh, that um, illusionism is actually true, and then people becoming more egoistic but the society has already been grad uh, gradually been acquainted with a higher level of, egoist of egoism because it simply had more egoistic traits that could be more robust to this experience because after all, it had already in the past millennia or millions of years or whatever its evolution took, um, was acquainted with its individuals being like a little bit egoistic um, and trying to exploit the others, having build more mechanisms to contain that egoism. In conclusion, um, AI may make illusionism more prominent for good or for bad reasons. Um, illusionism puts altruism at risks. Um, there may be few slightly more egoistic people um, or there may be many more, much more egoistic people. I think that is difficult to say, but altruism, uh, it, the, the idea that other people really have their a genuine value that goes much beyond everything else around us and seems to be after all a first order reason why we care about others uh, actively in our behavior really um, already any single person truly not caring about society um, might well have a being a serious danger for society i think um, I just just now as an example a hypothetical example a person like trump if, if you if you subscribe to him being a really um, egoistic person, well, you could see kind of the scale uh, depending on where a person arrives at. Um, voila. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, please do not hesitate to reach out. I'm very interested in having discussions on this topic. Thank you very much. Hello, this is Maharato Gota. I'm a philosopher and I teach philosophy at Biola University and also at Azusa Pacific University. Outside of the United States, uh, I also teach philosophy at uh, Addis Ababa University uh, in Ethiopia. Here is an abridged version of my paper entitled Artificial Intelligence and Metaphysical Limitations. Artificial intelligence uh, comes in two main forms, namely strong artificial intelligence and weak artificial intelligence. The focus of a strong artificial intelligence is on creating machines whose intelligence would be on par with that of the natural intelligence. 
In the case of weak artificial intelligence, electronic digital machines are taken to be devices that process massive amount of information with high speed and within a short period of time. The core assumptions that underlie strong artificial intelligence are metaphysical in nature. Consider, for instance, Alan Turing's famous question, can machines think? And David Chalmers' question, could a machine be conscious? Let us call collectively these two questions as the turing Chalmers ontological questions. Proponents of a strong artificial intelligence think that an affirmative answer can be established for the turing Chalmers ontological questions. Others strongly disagree. For example, Searle argues uh, that uh, no matter how complex they turn out to be, machines cannot be conscious or have an ability to think. John Searle argues that machines can be good in syntactical operations. Certainly, they are not uh, in a position to do anything when it comes to uh, a semantical operation. Uh, they only manipulate uh, symbols, you know, zeros and ones, mechanically and blindly, but uh, they do not really have any semantical grasp of what they actually execute. In this paper, I'm going to uh, discuss two largely ignored problems in dealing with a strong artificial intelligence. And I shall call these problems the maker product gap problem and the wrong location problem res uh, respectively. Here is the first problem, the maker product gap problem. Conditions for a strong artificial intelligence. Recently, Eric Olson in a paper entitled The Metaphysics of Artificial Intelligence makes compelling case as to what would have to be in place to establish the possibility of a strong artificial intelligence. In this regard, Olson raises two different questions. First, if anything in the nature of thought itself prevents it from occurring in electronic devices such as computers. Olson calls this the question of artificial thought. Second, if anything could be an artificial thinker, Olson calls this the question of artificial thinkers. Olson claims that the second uh, question about artificial thinkers deals with the sort of entity an artificial thinker would be. Olson claims that our investigation of the nature of an artificial thinker must also take into consideration other related important questions. If, for example, an artificial thinker exists, then such a thinker is expected to have mental properties. But what other properties would such a thinker also have? In this case, Olson further asks, would such a thinker be a material thing? If so, what sort of matter would make such a thinker up? But if an artificial thinker is not a material thing, then what sort of immaterial thing could it be? What might an artificial thinker be made of if it is not made of matter? For Olsen, the question of artificial thinkers must have an answer. That means that as Olsen claims, an artificially intelligent being would have to have some nature just like natural thinkers do. For Olsen, such an artificial uh, a being would also have to be either entirely composed of a matter or something different than matter. In light of this, Olson argues that to assess the prospect for a strong artificial intelligence, we need to know something about the nature of thought and consciousness taken in themselves. Olson claims, also claims that uh, we need to know something about the nature of thinking and conscious beings. Here, Olson's remarks directly re resonate with what I earlier you know, uh, referred to as the Turing Chalmers ontological questions. As we should see, the prospects of a strong artificial intelligence stand or fall depending on whether or not proponents of strong artificial intelligence are able to tackle the Turing Chalmers ontological questions. Olson claims that the focus of the contemporary discussion of the possibility of a strong artificial intelligence has been on tackling the question of artificial thought. By contrast, the question of the artificial thinkers is left entirely unexplored. For Olsen, artificial intelligence without the subject of such intelligence is hard to come by. Here is the gap problem. As things stand, nothing has been achieved by way of satisfying any of the sorts of conditions laid out by Olsen, namely creating artificial thought 
and artificial thinkers, not to mention their natures. That means that correspondingly nothing has been achieved by way of settling the Turing Chalmers ontological questions. This shouldn't surprise us given that the mainstream artificial intelligence theorists do not take as part of their research agenda important issues such as the nature of thought, the nature of phenomenal consciousness, and the nature of uh, the bearer of thoughts as well as phenomenal consciousness. As a related human capacity is largely ignored by artificial intelligence researchers include reading, creativity, and experience. But what I call the maker product gap problem independently emerged out of considerations of the source of metaphysical issues also addressed concerning a strong artificial intelligence. This problem arises due to failing to realize the presence of an inherent gap between human beings as makers or inventors of machines on the one hand and machines being mere products of human invention on the other hand. There are two main assumptions that underlie the maker product gap problem. Each of the assumptions that underlie the problem in question requires a detailed analysis and discussion. However, due to space limitations, I cannot do more than present a brief reflection on each of them, postponing considerations of objections and responses for another time. Here is the first assumption. When and if a strong artificial intelligence gets realized, then machines not only would enjoy equal status with human beings, but they also can be said to be superior to humans in many respects. Assumption number two. When and if a strong artificial intelligence gets realized, then it would show the capability of human beings to bring about conscious beings which think and act like human beings despite such beings having a non-biological or electronic substrate. Here is my assessment of the first assumption briefly. Suppose that you are the first person to have ever reached to the summit of Mount Everest. In this case, it wouldn't matter how many times other people subsequently may be said to have climbed to the summit, as being the first climber, necessarily you would maintain historical superiority over other subsequent climbers. Of course, someone other than you could have been the first ever climber to the summit of Mount Everest. In this case, your being the first climber is clearly a contingent fact. However, once you made it to the summit before any other person ever did, Necessarily, you would be the first ever climber to Mount Everest. Other people can climb as many times as they want after you have already reached to the summit of Mount Everest. But no one could um, strip you of the status you have as being the first ever climber to the summit of Mount Everest. Case closed. Your historical superiority over other climbers as being the first climber to Mount Everest is fixed. Although this is by no means a perfect example, it helps us to see what I take to be deeply problematic with assumption number one. Even if Olsen's conditions or the Turing Chalmers ontological questions were settled, that wouldn't even remotely increase the chances for machines to enjoy equal status with human beings. Similarly, it is hard to see how machines could be superior to human beings. The central problem of the first assumption is this. It confuses ontological superiority, which human beings necessarily have, over gadgets of their own handiwork with that of the incredible things machines do. The sense in which human beings are said to have ontological superiority over machines is rooted not only in the fact that human beings are the causal sources of the very existence of machines, but more importantly, it is also rooted in the fact that human beings are agents in a robust ontological sense. More important, that is, human beings are subjects of experience, they are bearers of mental, you know, phenomenal consciousness, they are also bearers of thoughts. They are rational agents who can act in light of reasons. They are beings with self-autonomy as well as with an ability to self-modify their behaviors and decisions in relation to both pre-planned and entirely unexpected unknown situations. In this case, machines would face what philosophers describe as the frame problem 
or the difficulty of navigating through various sorts of situations without being pre-programmed. So the move from undeniably incredible service that machines give us to the conclusion that at some point in the future, machines could achieve the sort of the sort of status that puts them to be on par with their makers, in this case, human beings, is entirely unjustified. No matter what level of complex tasks machines are said to execute, they do it blindly and mechanically based on how they are being put together by their makers. There is nothing mysterious about this. Machines deserve no credit for anything that they do. Of course, as da Daniel Dennett famously argued, one could take an in an intentional stance toward anything, including inanimate machines, and express say, appreciation for them. For example, in my view, but however, in my view, such appreciation is appropriate only if it is being done in some sort of metaf metaphorical sense. For example, I could express gratitude to my laptop when it works well, but that does not mean that my computer understands the reason for my appreciation. So my computer would have no incentive to keep on behaving well the next time I use it. Human beings are different from machines, not just in degree, but in kind. As E.J. Lowe puts it, quote, ironically, if we were to succeed in developing our artificial intelligence, that might provide the strongest possible testimony to the superiority of our own intelligence, end of the quote. As it is in the case of the Mount Everest example, our ontological superiority over present or any future machines is a fixed matter. So it seems to me. If I am right about this, then the strong artificial intelligence wouldn't eradicate the ontological superiority human beings have over machines. Hence, the maker product gap problem remains unresolved. The second assumption raises more serious metaphysical questions than the first one. I say this because the second assumption seems to confer upon human beings a property that they do not seem to have to begin with. To see my point here, consider Olsen's conditions we discussed earlier, namely the question of artificial thought and the question of artificial thinkers. Given a strong artificial intelligence, if Olsen's conditions were satisfied, can we then say that we uh, brought into existence a conscious being that would be indistinguishable from a being with a natural intelligence? If so, it seems to follow that the difference between us and machines would disappear. This would be re regardless of the fact that the substrate for human beings uh, remains to be biological, for a strong artificial agents remains to be electronic. So the term artificial we use to refer in relation to thought and thinkers would be highly misleading. So if the assumed scenario ever comes to be realized, then we would be obligated to drop the existing phrase artificial thought and collapse it into the phrase natural thought, and similarly collapse the phrase artificial thinkers into the phrase natural thinkers. So what we have here is conscious beings dressed up in digital machines and other qualitatively similar thinkers dressed up in biological bodies. Setting aside for now a thorny explanatory gap problem of accounting for how thought and its bearer could emerge from electronic substrate. It remains entirely unclear what metaphysical justification there is to think that human beings have a property that enables them to bring about a thought in its thinker or bearer by the process of making machines. Notice that a skepticism expressed here is different from that of Olsen's skepticism. In the case of Olsen, what he does is present a set of challenges that have to be met if a strong artificial intelligence is to have uh, is, 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 is a strong artificial intelligence uh, to have any hope of being achievable. The challenge I'm issuing here concerns why we should think that we have a sort of property, metaphysical property that qualifies us to bring about the realization of a strong artificial intelligence in the first place. Can we really bring about a thought and a stinker which is supposed to be the same in kind with us in the machines we ourselves create? 
If so, what metaphysical reasons are there for us to be so confident in our own ability to do such a thing? Here is the second problem, the wrong location problem. In our discussion up to this point, we have no encouraging news which would indicate promising prospects of a strong artificial intelligence. The question then remains, where could the motivation for a strong artificial intelligence be located? The correct answer for this question would bring us back to weak artificial intelligence. The progresses made so far at the level of weak artificial intelligence are said to underlie a display of more hope and confidence on the part of the proponents for the possibility of a strong artificial intelligence. So weak artificial intelligence is taken to be a good indicator of how much human beings could accomplish using their creativity, imagination, reasoning power, and general intelligence. Whatever success that has been achieved at this level must be a reflection of human um, creativity. If it is, then whatever activities machines are made to engage in by their makers cannot be a reflection of the machine's own creativity. If this is right, then no matter how spectacular, unexpected, or surprising it would turn out to be, it must be the case that what we witness in the activities of machines is itself an extension of our own mind. Here, by extension of our own mind, I mean what proponents of the extended mind theory generally advocate. At the heart of the extended mind theory lies the claim that the that uh, the human brain is not the sole house of the content of human life. For example, electronic devices such as smartphones, computers, and non-electronic uh, sources such as physical books contain massive amount of information. In this case, a body of information we ourselves have uploaded in these objects is said to be extended into our environment given that such objects are external to us. So it would be wrong to assume that the information contained in a book, say I published, belongs to my book or somehow is owned by it. Rather, it is my mind that is being extended into the book that I published. In this case, my book or a smartphone is the extension of my mind. To think otherwise would simply lead us to what I call the wrong location problem. This is the problem that arises when one fails to realize that the information machine's process ultimately traces its origin back to their makers. Machines own nothing. In light of this, it seems to me to be committing a category mistake when we attribute uh, the activities we see at the level of weak artificial intelligence to have their origin in the machines themselves as opposed to taking those information, the origin of those information to be extensions of human activities and power of reasoning. If this is correct, then the prospects of weak artificial intelligence moving us to the, to the next level, that's to a strong artificial intelligence, is now open for serious doubt. The position I laid out and defended in this paper could be said to face a huge obstacle in the light of the view known as the singularity. This is the view that postulates that in the future machines not only exceed human intelligence but also make themselves smarter and smarter, thereby leaving humans behind. If the sorts of reasons I give in this paper are plausible and correct, the core claims of singularity turns out to be entirely misplaced. Defenders of the singularity view first must come clean in terms of facing all sense conditions for a strong artificial intelligence head on. Otherwise, what is being asserted by fans of the singularity view turns out to be no more than inflated hyperbole. I remain undisturbed. In this paper, 
I discussed two problems, namely the Mecca product gap problem, the wrong location problem, uh, respectively. Concerning the first problem, I developed my arguments in light of Eric Olson's recent work on the metaphysics of artificial intelligence, in which he explores if there can be any sensible way by which electronic machines can be said to satisfy conditions necessary for natural intelligence. In this case, for Olson, mental phenomena and their bearers or owners took center stage. With respect to the second problem, I developed my arguments by adopting an extended mind theory which postulates that the content of mental life can extend into one's environment. In light of the reasons given, I conclude that the prospects for a strong artificial intelligence do not seem to be promising. Thank you.